I think that they missed the point. We all want to be sold. We all want to be sold on feeling like the decision that we made was the right decision. We all want to be sold on feeling like we got the thing, right? So if your friend tells you, oh my God, you need to check out this restaurant. It's just amazing. It's over here. You are lapping up that information. Or, oh my God, I just did this new workout. I've been shedding weight, whatever it is. You got to come and work out with me. You're quickly, happily being sold on it. What we want to make sure though is what's the intent behind it? This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I've got John Levy with me today, and the uh, the title of the podcast is called You're Invited, the Art and Science of Connection, Trust, and Belonging. John, welcome to the show. I'm super excited to be here. So let me introduce you real quick. So John is a behavioral scientist and a New York Times bestselling author known for his work, his works in trust, human connection, belonging, and influence. His clients include Fortune 500 brands like Microsoft, Google, AB InBev, and Samsung. And he's also the founder of the Influencers Dinner, a secret dining experience for industry leaders ranging from Nobel laureates, Olympians, executives, and artists. Um, his second book, You're Invited, The Art and Science of Connection, Trust, and Belonging, was just released in 2021. And that's what we're going to be focused on today because of its high level of relevance for uh, salespeople. Sure. Yeah, it's been, been a big hit for a lot of people. I'm, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it definitely made a splash here, and, and and you know, it's one of the influencing people is, and uh, you know, trust. I mean, these are big, these are big deals. Especially, it's especially for field salespeople who are the listeners of this of this show. Is yeah. um, so, I, I guess to dive into into the book, explain to to me the concept of inattentional blindness mm. and why this can be a massive hindrance to salespeople during the sales process. Uh, So is it okay if I start off with one ridiculous idea about human beings, which is (laughs) that literally everything we do uh, when it comes to the way we connect, we build trust, the way we create belonging, the way that we build relationships with customers, we do wrong or backwards. (laughs) That is a ridiculous thing about humans. I'm curious to say, I'm, I'm curious as to why, uh, why you say that. Well, I'll give you a whole slew of examples, but this is why inattentional blindness is so important. Inattentional blindness is this idea that human beings really are only good at paying attention to what we know to look for, and we miss just about everything else. And the simple example is you're in a room right now. I want you to look around the room and look for everything that is blue. Go ahead, look around. Now, close your eyes. I want you to point to everything that's green. And you probably can't, you can open your eyes. (laughs) And this is your room. This is, you've been sitting in there for, I don't know how long, right? Yeah. And the reason is that the brain is really trained to, or functions well to reduce the amount of energy it needs because energy is a limited resource. So it filters out everything that's non-critical and that you're not specifically looking for. The problem is that it means that we're missing a lot of information. And in that information fits two major categories, things that we think work really well, that we just keep doing, but actually they're terrible. And then there are those things that if we were aware of them, they would make us far more effective. And so my work, a lot of it, is in showing people the things that don't actually work and then demonstrating the counterintuitive things that really do. And for salespeople, it's been a game changer. Because things like, here's a simple one. In the business world, let's say I want to close a big deal with a client, I will email them, I will try to get 
an opportunity maybe to take them out for dinner to pitch the business, right? Have you ever been on one of these dinners? Only a thousand times. All right. <laughs> Scale of one to 10, how enjoyable are these dinners generally? Six. On your side. On the other side, it's probably a three. Not because you're not fantastic and charming and charismatic, but on the average across everything. And that's because I cannot buy your trust and I cannot buy a relationship with you. The mechanics just don't work that way for humans. There's Makes sense. One, one small loophole, which is, uh, do you have any kids? I do. Okay. How old are they? Uh, nine months old. But she, I can't, I can't buy her love yet because uh, she's not really aware of objects and possessions. She just thinks everything's hers. <laughs> yeah, well said. So let's say you had a seven-year-old, huge Harry Potter fan. If I buy a cameo for your kids from the cast of Harry Potter, they're going to be like, "Oh my God, Dad's friend is the coolest," and you will be incredibly appreciative because I did something for you that was very like vulnerable and specialized. But that doesn't scale at the level of how salespeople really need to operate, right? If you need to be connecting with 100 people a week or something like that, that's if you have that level of knowledge on people, it's kind of creepy, actually. Like, how did you get that information about my family? So what does work, though, is the exact opposite. It's called the IKEA effect. And the IKEA effect states that we disproportionately care about our IKEA furniture because we have to assemble it. So anything we invest effort into, we care about disproportionately. So if I actually want a customer to care more about me, what I want to do is find a very small way for them to invest effort into me. I might say, hey, can I get your opinion on something really quick? What would be better, A, B, or C? The moment they respond to that, they're then more likely to do something even bigger or care about my results more. Or it gives me an excuse to thank them and come back to them and respond, wow, you know what? Your advice was fantastic. Thank you so much. And the reason we know this is there's a, a really funny study that was done about asking people for directions. If I stop you on the street and ask you for complicated directions, you're probably not giving them to me. But if I stop you on the street and ask you for the time, you're probably going to give it to me. And then when I ask you the directions, you're probably giving me those directions. So notice two completely counterintuitive things. One is in our society, we think I'm going to buy this relationship by spending on you and you'll like me more when really the opposite works. The second is we think that if I ask for a lot, they're not going to agree to it. But it turns out that I'm asking now for two things and both become more likely than if I just ask for that one thing. And so it's completely counterintuitive and it's what actually works. That's just a, two examples out of I don't know, probably 50 I could give you. Very cool. Um, and and it, that makes total sense because what did you say? People, uh, people, don't, people are crazy. People don't make any sense. Yeah, we're completely irrational. <laughs> Like just absurd and absolutely ridiculous. That makes sense, though. I mean, you know, um, no, what you're saying, uh, definitely, definitely this, the coin drops for me. Um, mm -hmm. So we're doing things that don't work. And mm -hmm. there are other things that we could have been doing that would work. Um, so it, it's pretty obvious why this is so important. How can how can we focus on doing the more of the things that do work and fewer of the things that, that, that don't work? So I think the biggest thing, and this is actually one of these amusing bits of research that if you want to understand what makes defining genius is really difficult, but what, one of the most common things among people who we consider very brilliant, it's curiosity. It's asking the question, is this actually true? Because when we're young salespeople and we're being trained, we're told about all these things, right? Oh, there's seven steps to a sale or mimic people's behavior and so on and so forth. Okay, 
That's an interesting idea. Let's talk about mimicking behavior. Is it true? Are you actually experimenting with it? Are you looking at the research? If this is your area of income, of professional success, are you just going to accept things at face value or are you going to put it to the test? Because if any one of these had a 5% impact on my success, if I can stack 20 of them, that's double the income. And that is absolutely insane from a salesperson's perspective. From commissions to notoriety to whatever it is that matters to you. And so I think that we really need to get curious and challenge, hey, what's working and what really isn't working? and not just take it at face value. And the best people I've seen out there actually put things to the test. They experiment. They look at their sales pitch and they'll change one little thing every time they do it and see how people respond from the way that they make a joke at every point to the way that they present and the order that they present ideas. Here's a, a kind of crazy one. This is not, oh, no, actually I do mention this one in my book. And I want to emphasize these types of behavioral science cues can be very manipulative if done with poor intent, right? So when I look at things like the IKEA effect, I look at how do I bond with somebody because I care about having a relationship. So I'm really transparent with them. I'll say things like, hey, rather than us maybe going out to dinner or drinks and participating in like gorging ourselves and getting fat, how about the two of us go for a workout? It'll let us bond more. Because then the two of us are putting effort into something together. And then we'll go take a walk or something. It's much healthier. So I'm completely transparent in the way that I use it. But there's this kind of funny thing called the decoy effect, or uh, uh, we're really bad at making decisions in a vacuum. So I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, an option, a choice right now. You've just won a vacation and you can either go to Romania or you could go to Croatia and you'll have your wallet stolen or you can go to Croatia and have a great meal. Which do you choose? Um, I guess Romania <laughs> or, or the second Croatia. <laughs> I mean, please just pick one. It's, whatever you pick is fine. Uh, Croatia and have a great meal. Yeah, like 95% of people will pick that. Uh, then there'll be like the idiots who are always like, it'll be a better story if you steal my wallet. And I'm like, great, hand over your wallet. But, <laughs> but the point is that most people pick Croatia and having a great meal. There's nothing stopping you from having a great meal in Romania. But when you have a clearly worse option and a clearly better option in the same context, it's easier to make the decision. And so people tend to fall into that category. If you look at the way that Apple sells their computers, go onto their website and you'll tend to see three options, two that are very similar, but one that's clearly worse and one that's clearly better. And they design their sales process around these. Because when we give people a clear benefit at the same kind of relative price point or whatever it is, it's just much easier for them to make a decision. It's the way that we make decisions. If I'm in real estate and I'm showing you one townhouse and then two co-ops, one co-op is clearly worse than the other, then you have a point of comparison so you feel good about your choice to go with a nicer co-op. But if there's no point of comparison, then it's tough to make a comparison between two things that are so dissimilar. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, so it, the behavioral mechanics are all over the place. Uh, and if somebody's going to be a real professional, it's important that they put this to the test, not just like, oh, I read a great book about something. And then, you know, it sits there on a bookshelf feeling like a nice cocktail piece of advice. Well, and I, I think uh, I, I, I think this is a lot more than that for sure. I mean, the, even just the concept that we're trying to buy relationships when you you could be investing in uh, having a deeper relationship. And here's some, I mean, you gave one trick to having a uh, deeper relationships, getting people to, to invest in the relationship. I mean, part of me thinks, well, if they're not investing in anything, you know, if there's no give to get, if there's, if this is all one way, then yeah, it's not a relationship. It's just, you know, 
me working for them or something. But like the, I think you can't buy relationships, have real ones instead. I think there's, and there's lots of ways you can have a real relationship with another human, right? Yeah. If, if uh, and I think, you know, that that's a really important thing to think about. Like with your customers, are you having real relationships or are you kind of having like a weird manipulative um, one way relationship? I think it's also really important. I remember uh, seeing a study on insurance salespeople and how insurance salespeople saw themselves as like a central hub of the community where the, the customers really come to them for advice and support. And a lot of people see them, but when you actually pull the customers, they don't necessarily see the world that way. So I think we are, we view ourselves as much better at doing these things than other people do. And, uh, there's this kind of funny, famous study where people were asked, are you a better than average driver? And something like 85% of people said, yes, don't quote me on that number, but yeah, I, 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 I've seen I, that, that. That's a crazy thing about humans. We all think we're great at stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that it's completely unrealistic, right? Uh, we are far, far worse, although we might be functional, right? Like we might be decent at our job, but we'll think we're much better than we are. Because if I ask you for examples of times you've just crushed it, you can come up with that very easily. Your brain will find what you tell it to look for. Uh, so I think that the one of the big keys and what people don't realize is that I often hear, oh, but people don't want to be sold. And I think that they miss the point. We all want to be sold. We all want to be sold on feeling like the decision that we made was the right decision. We all want to be sold on feeling like we got the thing, right? So if your friend tells you, oh my God, you need to check out this restaurant. It's just amazing. It's over here. You are lapping up that information. Or, oh my God, I just did this new workout. I've been shedding weight, whatever it is. You got to come and work out with me. You're quickly, happily being sold on it. What we want to make sure though is what's the intent behind it? So when we look at the way that trust actually works, what it's made out of is not what people believe it's made out of. So for example, researchers generally agree trust is made of three things. Honesty, that you're telling the truth. Competence, that you are capable of doing the job that's expected of you. And benevolence, that you have other people's best interests at heart. Now, let me ask you a question. One of your coworkers comes in, messes up a presentation, but they're normally spot on. Do you say that person is incompetent? I cannot trust them anymore? No, because they're usually, they're usually competent. Yeah. So you would probably say, oh, they probably had a bad day. Let's find out what's going on. With them. They breached trust, but it wasn't a big deal. Now, let's say another employee, you find out that they've been lying to you. Will you begin to doubt everything they have said or everything they say moving forward? Yes, for, for sure. Yeah. So you can see that a breach in honesty is a bigger deal than a breach in competence. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say the two of us are walking down the street. And you say, hey, John, uh, I need to pick something up from my friend's place. Can we stop by really quick? And I go, yeah, of course. And when we get there, 40 of my closest friends jump out and scream, surprise, happy birthday. It would be super weird if I turned to you and I said, hey, you lied to me. We cannot be friends anymore. <laughs> That's right? true. That's true. So you can see you were being benevolent. Benevolent behavior is valued more than competence and honesty, right? It goes benevolence, then honesty, then competence. What most salespeople that I hear about because I only hear about the really bad ones, right? Uh, will do is they'll get on a call with somebody and be like, you know, your company is a top 10 account for us this year and it's really important to us to build a relationship. So they say things like relationship, but what they really mean are, I'll look really good if I close this because this is what my boss told me is really important for me to focus on. Mm -hmm. You might be competent, you might be honest, but you completely lacked any benevolence. So why the hell am I going to do business with you? 
All you care about in that sentence is you. The classic example I like to give is somebody who's selling server space. If you come to me and say, oh, our servers are up 99.99999% of the time, I go, wow, very competent. But if the next person says, hey, I know that for your business to succeed, your systems have to be up. It's your employee's ability to access their data. It is your ability to get work done. It is your customer's ability to get their information. We can't mess that up. Day or night, there's a problem. You call me, we'll figure it out. Which one of those two people do you trust more? Probably the second. Yeah. And that's because they led with benevolence. So when you're getting on a call with a customer or a potential customer, are you just trying to flaunt all the awards and accolades that you have? Or are you really getting in there trying to understand, hey, is this person buying because doing a really good job here will make them look good in front of their boss? Are they doing this because it will they're just stressed and they need stuff off their plate? Are they doing this because it's their career and their company and they want it to succeed so they can support their family? Like, what's the actual motivation? Are you in there with them? Because if you're not, then you're doing it wrong or backwards. Makes a ton of sense. Could, could you tell us the story of Iggy Ignatius and uh, and how he was able to offer his customers true meaning instead of another product and how that relates to this? Oh, sure. So there's this funny thing. Iggy was uh, had this dream. He He's an Indian man, grew up uh, or lived his career in, um, here in the US, uh, and was thinking of retiring back home to India when he got older, but then he realized that he didn't want to give up on the high quality of life here in the US or on being near his family because he had kids here and grandkids and all that. And so he had this dream of building a, a retirement community where he could be really understood. And it was dedicated to Indian culture, Indian food. There would be Indian activities. People could speak their native language and really feel like they're at home. Now, the day that he took financing to build this project, it was uh, 2008. And like within a week, the entire real estate market in, uh, in Florida had collapsed, right? The, dot, uh, the subprime mortgage fiasco. And yet, he was able to sell out every single unit at twice the price of all the units across the, uh, the highway from him with half the physical space. And that's because when you're thinking about what's important to you for the rest of your life, being a part of, your, of a community is incredibly appealing. We're fundamentally dealing with a loneliness epidemic in this country that we have never seen before. And it's not just here in the US, it's all over the world. And when you really look at what matters to people, when you look at what the great predictors of human longevity are, uh, team success, or even you know company stock value, it all comes to trust, psychological safety, and connection. And as a result of him being able to build community and connection, people were willing to spend multiples just to be in an inner circle. And I think that really goes to show that we don't understand people's pure motivations, right? We've reached a point where many people can afford to have space and luxury and all these things. And in fact, the word luxury has even completely lost all meaning. When you can get anything you want shipped to you within 24 hours in your house, then the question becomes, what do people really want and what's important to them? And if you look, human beings will do just about anything to fit in and feel connection. And so I think it's an important lesson to reevaluate what is it that you're actually offering and what is it that people actually care about? Yeah, and I, and I think that's, you know, empathy with your customers, understanding where their headspace is at is, 
they're really understanding them. There's there's few things more important than that. And I think yeah, if you're if if Iggy was selling uh, space in a retirement community, community connection, not being lonely. I mean, what could be more important than that, right? And getting to be yourself, right? Like in the sense that there's no lack of retirement communities in Florida, but the fact that he understood that there's a niche group that isn't getting what their their culture developed in is a really big deal right it's uh it's almost reminiscent of like the you have you ever seen the show the marvelous miss Maisel? no uh it's about a jewish comedian and so like you know in the in the uh 1950s like the jewish communities in the in northern new york that like for the summers they would all go and they would summer together and you know it was a thing oh i think i, I think i saw a preview for this actually yeah. but, but it was and like so, a bunch of old people like like up, yeah. up in these communities but the 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 point is that for people belonging really is critical and if you can understand how to create that sense of belonging and connection also not just with one customer but maybe bringing your customers together it's a huge difference then they want to stick around because let's be honest i can't really connect with everybody there's certain personalities that we just clash but if i can get my customers to feel connected to each other and their life improves as a byproduct of it they're going to stick around regardless of if they like me or not a great point they i've read so many times how important it is to build a community of cust of your customers and i think that's uh that's something we could all do a better job of i mean that's it's hard to do but worth the investment it, it's super it it's it's one of these things that's rather simple but takes an incredible commitment to time and it's you, there's no like ultra fast forward to community right it's there's kind of these characteristics like frequency that they meet, uh, intensity of the experience, time that they spend together, and proximity. Are they near each other and other? Like, so there's familiarity. And most people aren't willing to put in that much effort over time. Um, but when you have a community, then you're always top of mind. When you're a part of a community, people will support you when things are down and will champion you when things are good and it's it's what let us survive we're not the fastest or the strongest species but we are better at working together than almost any other species out there thumbs and words thumbs and words got to use them in sales <laughs> thumbs and words so what's special about us thumbs yeah. and words oh yeah yeah but let's just work Opposable, together opposable digits yes <laughs> fantastic then you can pass me a piece of paper that's right right hold a pen to sign stuff i love it yeah thumbs and words um well so you, you what one thing that you you talk about that i think is so interesting um uh, of the of the top 100 most trusted companies only two of them were founded in the last 20 years mm -hmm. Um, I think that's really important for salespeople to think about, and I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, and also your thoughts around how we can, how referrals can help us to to gain some of that longevity and trust. So there's this kind of funny thing. I share this as a story in my uh, book. In 1911, a guy walks into the Louvre Monday, August goes into the Renaissance section, finds a completely obscure, super tiny painting, rips it off the wall, and disappears with it. Nobody notices. The Louvre at the time was protected by 11 mostly drunk legionnaires, and it's a thousand rooms. Newspapers across the world shared the story of a painting that's gone missing, and suddenly the entire world knew this painting. People stood in line just to see the empty spot on the wall. Three years later, the painting was finally recovered. And when it was returned, once again, the world rejoiced. And that is the only reason any of us know which painting. The Mona Lisa? Yeah, the Mona Lisa. 
The Mona Lisa is a fantastic painting, but it is not the greatest painting in the world. It is simply famous for being famous. And we've forgotten the story. It is the Kim Kardashian of 1911. <laughs> I was going to say, that reminds me of something. <laughs> now, for human beings, there's this very strange thing called the mere exposure effect. And the mere exposure effect simply states that the more often we see something, the more we tend to trust it and like it. Right? Because if I'm around you 50 times and each time I've survived being around you, it's probably pretty safe. I'm probably not going to kill you on the 51st. I mean, you never know, yeah. though. I've, I, I like to throw a good curveball. <laughs> it's that 52nd time that really gets you. Watch out. So, well, I think, and I think that's really important for friendship and human relationships in general, right? Like, it, yeah. It, you, the, the longer you've known someone, you, you know, the, the, the closer, closer you become in, in general. It's kind of, it's almost linear in a weird way where it shouldn't be. So, it's, it's, there's something I'd argue slightly different, but yeah, you can probably map it to some kind of, uh, linear growth there. Uh, now, here's where where it overlaps with kind of what you were pointing to, right? This, um, the most trusted companies are the ones that have been around the longest. We've seen them the longest. If they couldn't deliver their product, they probably would have shut down by now. But- Coca-Cola, giving us sugar water since 1924. <laughs> yeah, fantastic, right? Like, bravo. <laughs> keeping, what is it? Keeping dentists in business since before you were born. Uh, so the, the important thing, though, is that there is a real value to exposure over time, right? I said, I pointed to four things earlier. It was frequency, intensity, uh, duration, and proximity, right? So if you're increasing the frequency over time, you'll increase the potential for trust or the potential for connection. And in order for a salesperson to stay top of mind, you need to create each of these things, right? You need to look at, okay, what's the frequency that I'm going to be in front of them? It's probably not very frequent. What's the proximity, it's probably near zero because you're probably in different cities. Duration, you might have a bit of control with once you're actually meeting. Okay. Right. And intensity, that's the activity that you choose to do. Are you just going to sit down and go to a meeting? Or are you going to take a walk? Or are you going to do a workout? Or are you going to do something novel that stands out? And so now you can begin to play with the mechanics of these things. So Here's the more important part. If let's say I really like you as a customer, or even if I don't, let's say we don't even mesh, but I host a community gathering that happens, let's say once or twice a month. And you start coming to it, not because of even me, but because of the content that's there or the people that are there, whatever it is. Then we increase frequency, we increase duration, right? And then when you're catching up with Shauna, who you met at one of the events, you're like, then Shauna might mention me or you might mention me because where you met or because we have each other in common. So now I've increased frequency again because I was the one who gathered everybody. The problem is that most corporate accounts are just absolutely terrible. Not accounts, sorry. Corporate events are absolutely terrible. They're just the same cookie cutter BS that everybody else does. And there's no differentiator. So it has to be novel. And you know, there are all these other characteristics that I go to in my book. But if you really want to have something special that people talk about, connect over, community gets created, I think that's where the real opportunity is because people are feeling more disconnected than ever. And frankly, our social skills have atrophied because of the pandemic. Yeah, I totally agree with uh you know and i i think that's uh it's it's something we're dealing with as a, as a as a world that we we've we're very social creatures and uh we we weren't social for a while and it's almost like we're, we're also very habitual creatures so we're, we're, we've almost become habituated to our own misery 
And, uh, and, and, you know, across the board, all, all the folks listening to this podcast are field salespeople for the most part. So they, um, they, they, uh, in general, I think enjoy interacting with people more than the average person probably right off the bat, but also it was real bad for their business to, uh, for everyone to hide in their bedroom under a blanket for two years. That was bad. Yeah. And if you, if you sell, if you sell beer to bars, that was uh, 2020 was a bad year. So yeah um but yeah i uh super interesting and and and, and what about the referrals piece um how, how how can we leverage referrals uh to to gain more trust or why why is that important so here's one of these interesting things and actually, could you repeat the question? Because I want to make sure I actually answer the question you're asking and not the one I think you're asking. Um, so that I, I guess I was talking about how only two of the top 100 most trusted companies were founded in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And 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 I, and I wanted to talk about how, you know, I, you know, there's a correlation between how long you've known somebody, you know, duration, I guess you were talking about, you know, frequency, duration, intensity, proximity. Uh, duration is important for for relationships for friendships and and you know can, from a sales perspective it, it can referrals really help um get around this hey I, I don't have much duration with you but you can trust me because we you you can have a relationship with me because we both know hmm. we, we both know Jessica and Jessica's vouching for for me and my so, product I think that you're uh So I think that there's a whole lot there, right, to, to unpack. One is the question of, if I ask you for a referral, even if I don't you, know you very well, the person that you're referring me to might actually trust me more than you do because it's coming in warm rather than necessarily cold. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second is that by me asking for the referral, it, when you invest that effort, you actually care about me more. So it's that IKEA effect. The key, though, is I would probably start off with something small before I'd ask for a referral. I might ask for your opinion on something so you feel a bit more invested. Mm. And then ask for the referral or ask for something and then I would stack it so that way you're as invested as possible. Now, the key is not just to be a taker, right? Nobody likes people who are completely selfish. Reciprocity has to exist. Otherwise, a society breaks down. And I believe it was Adam Grant did some great research on this that looked at who are the most successful and least successful people? Are they givers, those that are generous, takers, those that are selfish, or matchers, those that mimic whatever behavior they see? And what he found is that the least successful are the givers and the most successful are the givers. And what separates the two groups are those that know where to draw the line. So if I give so much, I'm giving my clients away or our margins away, then I become less successful. But if I know where to draw the line, then I support people and I get the reciprocity and the generosity from the givers and the matchers and all that. So I think that there's a lot to this that we can really take into account. Um, and also human beings are really complex. So not everything works every time. So true. Um, Tell me about, uh, in chapter 15 in the book, you talk oh, wow. about- I do not remember what <laughs> the chapters I'll, are. I'll, I'll remind you. <laughs> okay. um, which, which line and which paragraph? Because I obviously the, have this memorized. On the seventh page, let me just flip. No, uh, it, it, you, naming a designing path, naming designing a path, or it was, that was, sorry, the chapter was named designing a path. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you talk about, how in order to achieve real success, salespeople need to learn how to design backward. Could, could you could you talk about that and how teach people how that works and what you what you meant by that? Sure. So I believe the example I give there 
is about Walt Disney World. Have you ever been? I have several times, yeah. Okay. So it has a pretty unique design. I don't know if it's still like this because of the pandemic. So please excuse me if this is a year or two out of date. No, don't worry. It was it's Florida. There was only a pandemic for like two months. It's fine. <laughs> they're 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 back. So, Disney, Disney World is really back very early. They they opened up. I, I actually I mean, went it, there. it is open air most of it. So it's not like it's a huge That's know. right. Yeah. I, I was there in twenty in the end of twenty twenty, like December of twenty twenty. It was uh it was already back back to normal there. So what happens is that you arrive, drive your car in, park, go up an escalator, buy a ticket at a counter, and then board a 23-minute monorail or boat ride. And the question is, why would they make you wait 23 minutes to get to the front entrance? Why not just sell the tickets at the front entrance? The answer is that uh, that the average income in the U.S. is, at least before the pandemic, was about $44,000 after taxes. And a five-day family pass there is like, I think, 1200 bucks or something. It's just crazy. So that's a, an intense and immediate buyer's remorse. And according to somebody I spoke to at the Disney Institute, now this might be more rumor than it is fact, the length of time that that buyer's remorse lasts is 23 minutes. That way, when you enter the park, you can actually be happy. And it's supposed to be the happiest place on earth. And you're also ready to spend again. Now, in my work, we call this the elephant, the rider, and the path. If the human brain is an elephant and a rider, the elephant would be our biases, our mechanics, our emotions, very big and strong. And the rider would be our logical side. Right, very measured and consistent. And, uh, you know, in the morning, our rider can guide our elephant to a healthy breakfast. But by five in the afternoon, if it sees a candy bar on the counter, by 501, it's gone. And you have never been more creative than when you justify why you deserve that candy bar. So here's the deal some companies try to speak to the rider, we logic the heck out of them. You know, you will save three cents per dollar and blah, 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 and all that. That's fine. It just doesn't work very well. Some companies speak to our elephant much bigger, much stronger. It says things like, how good would it feel? Oh, imagine the experience of, right? Like Apple. Apple's fantastic at making you feel unique and special, just like everybody else who buys their products. But then there's a third smarter option, which is, listen, I could speak to the elephant and the rider all day. It will still give you buyer's remorse when you buy that ticket. So what Disney did was they said, we're gonna design a path for the elephant and the rider to go down that is so rigid that I know where the elephant and rider will end up at the end. We need to, we're not gonna be able to convince the elephant to feel good about the purchase. We're not going to be able to logic the rider into being okay with it. What we need to simply do is entertain people for 23 minutes until they're emotionally ready to be in the park. And so they said, okay, we need to design from the end. The end result is what matters. What emotional state do people need to be in when they get to the park? And then they design the journey backwards from there to say, okay, this journey needs to be X minutes long. It needs to take these things into account. We need to entertain people so it's fun for them and they get to see the park from a distance and they get to see the characters and all that and the kids are amazed and all of that, right? So that way, when you enter the park, it's magic. It is the happiest place on earth. And so when we look at how we interact with people, you can't logic them into stuff and you can't logic somebody into falling in love with you. It's, I mean, maybe it works occasionally. Can you emotion them into it? Probably. But what's way easier than all of that is to design a journey based on human mechanics so that by the end of the journey, they are where they need to be. Now, the key I'm going to emphasize is to do it in a benevolent way.
We have to have other people's best interests at heart. We have to be transparent in what we're doing. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is when a client finds out what you did, you're going to lose the client. And then you're going to develop a bad reputation because these industries are small and people switch companies and so on. And so the key is to act ethically with transparency and with benevolence. But you want to design from the end to the beginning, not from the beginning to the end. That makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, and, and I think we all need to think about the end state that our customer is going to be at. And then, because that's really, you know, when they, when other people ask them, hey, how was this experience? Or, oh, you, you know, you use this, don't you? How's that? How is that? What they're, they're not going to talk about their buying journey. They're going to talk about, well, this is what, this is where I've ended up. This is what I've got out of this. Mm -hmm. um, this is how I feel about it, is what they'll say. Right makes a ton of it makes a, a a ton of sense to me this has just been fantastic where can listeners read more about about what you've written um obviously your books uh how, how can they reach out to you how do they how do they get in contact with you oh it's super easy so my website is just johnlevy.com j-o-n-l-e-v-y.com anybody can reach out there i try to answer every single message it might be a few days but I really do get back to everybody. I spend a lot of my time traveling to give talks and doing trainings for teams and stuff like that. Uh, but I will do my best to get back to everybody. Also, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm really good. Uh, John Levy, TLB, J-O-N-L-E-V-Y, T like Thomas, L like Lion, B like Boy. Uh, and then my book is called You're Invited, uh, The Art and Science of Connection, Trust, and Belonging. And it's chock full of wild stories and science and counterintuitive things that really work. So I hope it helps people. All right. Well, fantastic. Um, I, I uh, don't want to keep you over here, but but John, I really, I really appreciate you taking the time to teach us this stuff. Oh, my, this has been an absolute pleasure. All right. Well, John, I'm going to try to summarize everything that you've taught us today. Um, so. Uh, First of all, inattentional blindness is all about filtering out everything that's not crucial. Um, but the problem with this is that we filter out, and our minds do that. Our minds are inattentionally blind, right? Uh, but the problem with inattentional blindness is that we also filter out a lot more information that we that could have benefited us when we're selling. Another really important point, you cannot buy trust. One thing you can do is you can try the IKEA effect where when people invest in you, they care more about you. Anything we invest effort in, we care more about. That that IKEA dresser that I spent four hours putting together is a great example. I, I just I'll love that dresser till the day I die. <laughs> but uh, so you want to find ways to get people to invest a little effort uh, in, in you and your organization so that they care more. Be curious as a salesperson and, and challenge what's working and what's not working. Be a scientist and that will, that will make you more successful if you're always tweaking things, testing things, uh, behaving like a scientist. You can try the decoy effect. Uh, we're bad at making decisions in a vacuum. And so it, it can help to give prospects and customers options with one of those options being a clear benefit. And that makes it easier for them to, uh, to make a decision and, and make a purchase. We, we can learn all about that from Apple or my trip to Croatia. Um, well, and this has been a, a, a fantastic episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you work in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps, the number one route planner that helps you sell 20% more and drive 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today. If anyone can think of any of their sales reps that would benefit from um, this really interesting thoughts about how the human mind and how humans work that John's taught us, um, definitely share this episode along to them. Take care until next time, everybody. <laughs>